Legends, welcome back to another episode of the Ruck Infringement Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Joey, and this is another Ruck Infringement Podcast special interview. Today's guest, former Parramatta Eels legend, Steve Eller. Steve, how are you, mate? Hey, Joey, I'm good, mate. How are you going? Mate, I am wonderful. It is a pleasure to have you on. Uh, let's start off with getting to know you. Now, who are you? That's a good question. <laughs> I asked that question a fair bit, actually. Um, I suppose how do I the answer that? I um, I grew up at uh, in two different areas. I grew up in, in the Aboriginal community of La Perouse, um, yep. and and out at Cabramatta where, where I went to school. So I um, uh, sort of grew up in two worlds in the Aboriginal community and and uh, Mount Pritch- uh, Cabramatta where I ended up playing junior footy for Mount Pritchard. So yeah, it was um, enjoyable childhood. Yeah, very nice, mate. Now, was it always rugby league for you, or was there another sport on the radar when you were young? No, we're a we're a rugby league family. My um, my dad, my uncles, they all played uh, uh, footy down in the, in the South Sydney Junior area. Um, even my cousins, Mark, Glenn, and Gary, were rugby league players, and um, yeah, they went to went to rugby after. But um, they're league players, and that's how come they, I suppose they're so good at rugby because of their uh, their rugby league skills and. Um, yeah, I was in a rugby league family, so yeah, it was always going to be the way I went. Nice. Now, let's talk about coming through the grades. What are some of the teams that you played with? Um, I suppose I started off at Mount Pritchard. Um, I was probably six at the start of Mount Pritchard. Eric Grace yeah. started um, at Mount Pritchard a year after me. Um, uh, we had one or two years together as kids, and then uh, Eric went to um, he went down the Canola area, and I I went over to East Mount Pritchard a few years later, and um, Eric came back to play at East Mount Pritchard with me. So Mount Pritchard, to East Mount Pritchard, and that's that was where we played our all our junior footy. So um, it was just a I suppose those two clubs that we that we played at, and um, but in in saying that we played the junior junior reps from um. Uh, Harold Matthews, uh, SG Board, Jersey Flag. So I had two years at Jersey Flag. Um, Eric and myself played a year up um, in Jersey Flag. Then we played out in, in our age group. So, uh, yeah, so I had, uh, had a fair few years in the, in the Parramatta Junior ranks and that was that was really enjoyable. Yeah, we had the guru on the other week. He's a he's a character, absolute uh, legend <laughs> of the game. But, uh, mate, let's talk about uh, playing for the Eels. Let's talk about your debut. So you obviously you make it in the first grade. Tell us about that first game you played. Um, probably in 1979. I um, it was two things. Firstly, um, I got asked to sit on the bench uh, against West in '79. So yeah, um, I come on, um, which was nice in my first game there, and ended up scoring a try in my first game, which was good. Yeah, and then good. I come on, <laughs> uh, then I come on a week later um, as a reserve against. Uh, um, Newtown, and um, that was yeah. enjoyable as well. And um, and then the week later, uh, we were playing Cronulla, and Eric and myself were, were picked in the first grade team, um, which was our, probably our first grade, full first grade debut in regards to being picked in the mm-hmm. side. So, yeah, we played Cronulla at Cronulla, and it was freezing, it was cold, and it was a little bit wet. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a really enjoyable game. But I actually had to mark Steve Rogers, who was probably one of my childhood heroes, and yeah, um. Yeah, they, they beat us twenty five nil. So we sort we copped the toweling that day, but it um it was one of those one of those games that you you don't forget because of, of who I was playing against. And yeah. yeah, he um I had Mick Cronin inside me, Steve Steve Rogers opposite me, and they were the Australian centres at the time. And uh, yeah, it was just one of those really nice uh, occasions. Even though we got beat twenty five nil, it was just it was the start of something that we we thought was going to be very like very special for us. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I didn't put this question in, but you just mentioned Mick Cronin, and uh, I, I, I remember hearing about how you two were one of the deadliest centre combinations going around. So, what, what do you put that down to? Did you guys just have good chemistry, or what was it that made you two so great? That's a good question, actually. Um, <laughs> I, I suppose one of the things that I was always conscious of was how. Uh, how strong Mick, Mick was and how he had, he yeah. demanded attention from the other players and I was always worried about Mick and um but it wasn't just Mick having Mick inside me was it was a sort of a steadying influence in our team because mm-hmm. you know, we we had Sterlo, myself Brett Eric Paul Taylor yeah. Neil Hunt um, we're all all the same age 
And uh, Mick Cronin was about six or seven years older than him. So oh, wow. it was a sort of steadying influence. But when teams were very aggressive towards this, Mick, Mick was the one who stood up and, and um, I suppose, handled the, the toughness and allowed us to play our, our, running, our running game. So, yeah, when games got tough, Mick was – he really stood up for us and really protected us and, and allowed us to play our game. And, and I suppose that, that allowed Brett to play his game and um, whether Brett was in the centres or Brett was at 5'8", where I was in the centres at 5'8". The crowd was the, was the uh, I suppose, the the mainstay. And mm. uh, he was the he was the one who, who always kept us uh, level-headed. He was the one who always made sure we were on track. And he'd read the game um, as good as anyone I've seen. And he'd, he'd put us in positions to run the ball um, at times when we didn't realise we it was it was time to run because we we're, we're going now and, and bang we, and something would happen but it was just Mick who um who always led the way and um from B- Brett and myself he we probably wouldn't have achieved what we achieved without Mick inside us or outside us. Yeah, no, mate, uh, incredible player um back in back in those days as well. But mate, let's talk about uh, your nickname, Zip Zip Man. And when that came about and, and how did that uh, transpire? Right. So I've had that name a fair while now. So <laughs> my, even my wife calls me Zip. So my kids call me Zip sometimes. So um, it's funny. I, there was a, a journalist back in the 80s for, called Peter Flingos. And um, yeah, so Pete was, a, it was one of those journalists that had a lot of credibility. Um, yeah. And yeah, he, he actually built a lot of trust around players, which is not. I suppose very rare these days, but he absolutely he was one of those he was one of those journalists that um, he actually didn't mind talking to because he wouldn't write stuff that you didn't want written. Um, and he, if he was going to write something about you, he'd ask permission first. Yeah. Um, so he was actually one of those one of those journalists with credibility, very similar to Neil Cadigan. So, um, so he in the in the Daily Mirror back in the early eighties, he used to write a segment in the in the in the Daily Mirror, which was the paper at the time. Of the try of the week, and um, I set up I set up a try against some team. I don't know what it was, but he said, "Well, as I got the ball, I zipped here and I zipped there, and <laughs> um, passed to such and such. You passed it on and score, and um, we scored. So that was the try of the week that he put in the paper, and he describes it in the paper. And when I went to training, they start all the boys started calling me Zip, so it's stuck ever since. So, <laughs> so that's fine. <laughs> I'm happy with that's it. That's great. That's great. It's, hey, it's definitely a nickname that's stuck. Um, I think you know a few of you guys had some back then. We had Guru and um, Bert, of course, as well. So, man, yeah. I love it. The zip, uh, one of the one of the best. Now, were you superstitious when you played, or did you have any teammates that had strange or funny rituals? Oh, look, I wasn't. I wasn't really superstitious, but um, I was I always wore the same pair of speedos every game. Yeah, nice. So, um, yeah, I mean that was I suppose something. Um, and the other thing which I always did. Um, which I started when I first started playing grey, and I kept it all the way through till I retired. Was I? Um, I wouldn't put my shorts on till I, I was ready to run out in the field. Okay. So um, yeah, I just yeah, I just when I, I when I'm ready to go out and warm up, I'd um, I'd put my shorts on. Before that, I'd just walk around in my speedos, <laughs> jump a short socks. Yeah, it's just just one of those things. Just I got into the habit of doing that, and um, yeah, just that sort of stuck all the way through. Yeah, nice, mate. I I hope you washed them, of course, between games. But uh... <laughs> well, yeah, well, they, they, they got dirty most most games because um, one of those those, uh, those big big fellas got running at me. <laughs> oh, I love it, mate. Oh, it's wonderful. Now, uh, you mentioned him before, but who was your footy idol when you were growing up? Oh, look, I probably had two. Like from a uh, someone who runs the football, Steve Rogers was was certainly yeah. someone I looked up to because he was wonderful the way he ran the football and um, um, having a running game myself, I, I, admire, I admire him and, and his skills. And, and I suppose the, the one who I really looked up to as a, uh, as a, I suppose a, an idol who um, I aspire to not be like, but um, I aspire to play with or whatever was Arthur Beetson. Yeah. I ended up playing with, I ended up playing with Arthur in 70, 1978. Um, and um, ended up playing, no, 79, 1979 in the, I think it was the MK Cup or whatever they call Tooth Cup, the mid the mid week games we used to play. And I, I played it in North Sydney um, uh, with Arthur. And Arthur uh, put a ball on and put me over and I scored. And it was just one of those 
moments that I've been I've been looking forward to as a kid because he was my idol growing up. Being a well, not only but not because of the way he played, but being a um, uh, a strong advocate for Aboriginal culture and yeah. being a um, like just a wonderful player and yeah, yeah he, he just him 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 and his his presence on the field was always just uh, wonderful to see. But yeah, Arthur was was the one I um, I really loved to watch. But Steve Rogers as a as someone who ran the ball, it was just special as well. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Now, let's talk about that incredible Eels team of the 80s and what you guys were able to achieve. You know, we hadn't seen it done until Penrith recently, but just take us through that team and uh, what you loved about that time playing for Parramatta. I suppose there's a couple of things. I mean, the first thing I'll, 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 I'll start off with is Everyone talks about how good our backline was, and look, we we did have a special backline, and and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of go into that a bit later. But the mm. the first thing I'd probably say is our forwards never got the credit they deserved. But yeah. We we had a wonderful team, but our forwards were the, the ones who laid a platform for us to do what we used to do. Um, it doesn't matter how good your side is if your forwards aren't performing and your forwards aren't um, on the front foot. It's really hard for backs to perform and. Our forwards, even though they were smaller than most most packs, and um, most packs were bigger and stronger, like our, our forwards never gave up and, and dominated um, in a lot of ways, and it allowed us to do what we do. So, firstly, yeah, the forwards, um, led by Pricey, uh, Steve Edge, yeah. and then there's players like Steve Sharp, Peter Wynn. Um, yeah, Bob O'Reilly was special when he was playing with us as well, because he was to follow the bear around, and, and um, <laughs> yeah, his ball skills are just exceptional. And he actually passed those ball skills on the on the John Muggleton, who uh, and Muggo was was one of those players I followed all the time because Muggo could read the game as good as Sterlo, and it just following Muggo around the field, his ball skills are just exceptional. And um, yeah, firstly playing with the Bear, then then Muggo was just yeah really special. So that was probably the, the first thing. The second thing is is playing with with people like Sterlo and Brett, Eric, the Crow. And then you got Paul Taylor, Neil Hunt, Dave Lydiard. Yeah. Uh, they were just wonder, not only wonderful players, but wonderful people. And we're all like, we're still got real, all the real good mates. And we, and we catch up on a regular basis, but we we all complimented each other, which was one of those, I suppose, rare rare things in a footy team. And we all had our own own set of skills, and all those all all those skills complemented the way we played. And um, having having Sterlo lead the way and. Um, like Sterlo was like Wally. He could read the play two or three plays ahead and put us in yeah, position well. to do what we need to do. The Crow was was um, special, like I said, but having Brett, who's probably the best player I've ever seen, um, and play with um, inside to be able to do what he does. And it just, although all, my job was just to follow him and the Crow, mm-hmm. and it just made my job a lot easier as well. And, and if I run into trouble, I give it to Eric. So, um, yeah, having Eric outside me just made, a, made life so much, much easier as well. Because if I had too far to. If I, if I had too far to run, I'd give it to Eric. <laughs> so, but um, then you had Neil Hunt and um, on the other side, he was just – he had a step and he could read the game and his, his ball skills and his the way he played was great as well. And yeah. But Paul Taylor had the, had the work rate of uh, – probably the best work rate of, out of many of our players. and Very underrated, but geez, we, we didn't underrate him. We, we knew how special he was for us. And then um, and Dave Lydiard come on as, and when he started playing with us, Lids had uh, speed, he had skill, and uh, it was tough as well. So, um, yeah, we look, we just had a bunch of good blokes who really enjoyed each other's company, but um, we excelled at, at, with each other's skills, um, uh, complementing each other. So it was just yeah, one of those really nice environments to be able to play in. And and, um, and for us, it was just playing with your mates, but you don't realise how special it was until years later. Yeah, for sure. Do you think, uh, obviously, the Jack Gibson effect, do you think that, uh, had part to do with it as well. Like, what an incredible coach he was. What what did he bring to that side? Well, I think Jack had a fair bit to do with it. I think what Jack brought to the side firstly was discipline. Yeah. Um, he taught us about discipline, commitment, and he taught us about respecting each other. Um, but the thing which Jack, brought, I think, brought brought to us, um, which I appreciate the most, was he actually made us better people. Um, football is great, and, and, and becoming better footballers is one thing, but you want to become a better football, you've got to become a good person as well. Yeah, um, and he had really, his values were were um, exceptional and he passed them on to us. I'm sure we had our own, our own upbringings, um, which taught that as well. But 
yeah. when it comes to uh, committing ourselves to to um, achieving a, a common goal, he he led the way in that, and he showed us what we what we need to do, how to do it. Um, his his commitment to to us was second to none. Um, but he 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 cared for us as people, and I think caring for us as people allowed us to to give back to him. Um, and if we like Jack out of philosophy, if we were doing well off the field, um, think not having any problems, um, and you're working, you've got good ethics, everything on the field will work just as well. So if you're have you're struggling you're struggling off the field and things aren't going well, that's going to affect the game. So. Yeah. Jack's first priority was to make sure everyone was doing okay off the field. So, and that taught us a little bit about him, and and also a little bit about life. Yeah, no, that's awesome, mate. He he seemed like an incredible guy, uh, mate. From there, let's talk about the Origin Arena. Now, you got you were lucky enough to play for New South Wales, mate. What was that like stepping out into the cauldron at his Origin? Uh, it's probably one of those feelings that you don't realise, or you can't really hard to explain. Um, yeah. Running out the like the Lang Park, yeah, that was that was like running into into a uh, boiling pot. Like the, it was, you're running out into uh, thirty, forty thousand Queenslanders who hate you, uh, and it was just yeah, really eerie feeling. But I suppose the role when we when we got out there was just to to go out and play footy and do what we did. But yeah. uh, Queensland playing Queensland in Queensland is a a really arduous task because they grow an extra leg. When they, when they put that jumper on and when they uh, when they're playing Queensland in front of their own crowd, um, they grow an extra leg. And um, yeah, you know, I was lucky he played. I, I picked I picked in ten, but I only ended up playing in eight because I pulled that injury on two two occasions. But I ended up playing in eight, one four, lost four, scored four tries. So look, I, I I was happy with that. But it was the opportunity to play against um, probably uh, Wally Laws had his best. Um, G Miles at his best, Greg Dealing at his best. Yeah. Um, so those sort of players and and um, get it, and Mal Meninga at, at his best, and just having the opportunity to play with those players in the Test arena was, yeah, just one of those uh, things that you cherish in in your football career. And um, yeah, they were just they were just special times. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I could only imagine. Now, from there, you moved into representing your country. Now, what was that like? And for you, was that the pinnacle of rugby league? Well, it was the it was the pinnacle because I, I I played for Australia before I played State of Origin. Yeah, yeah. So um, I got picked in the, in the kangaroo team from um the from uh, after we won the eighty two grand final. So um, yeah, playing for Australia was was my first representative game, and um, which was really I suppose that to put it in context, it was something that I'd been aiming to do and, and wanting to do and a, a dream of mine since I was a kid. Yeah. I used to watch all the kangaroo tours, all the test matches as a kid growing up. Um, so uh, one of my dreams was to was to play for the kangaroos and uh, having the opportunity to do that uh, come at a price for me because it was, it was my, probably the most challenging time of my life because at that time my partner um, um, uh, was pregnant with my first daughter, Rachel. And um, I had to make a decision: do I stay for the birth, or do I go on the kangaroo tour? So yeah. it was probably the hardest decision I had to make. And um, and I suppose the decision I made was to go on the tour because if I didn't go, if I if I go on the tour, become an Australian representative, it allows us to open doors to actually provide provide for the family in a better way. Yeah. Um, if I don't go, um, I'll be there for for the birth of my baby, which is which is also special. But a lot of those doors wouldn't be open to be able to. Um, I suppose look at uh, how we uh, look after ourselves moving forward. So I ended up making a decision to, to go on the kangaroo tour, and I didn't see my um, my, my daughter. I think my daughter Kristen, I my kids picked up, but um, the second daughter Kristen. So it was I didn't see Kristen until she was three months old, and um, which is probably the hardest thing that I've, that I've ever had to had to go through. But um, going on the kangaroo tour was 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 one of the most special times of my life, but the, also one of the hardest times of my life. Yeah, mate, absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, you you hear that these days as well, and it would be such a tough call. Mate, let's talk through your finals appearances. Of course, you had a few of the big ones, the grand finals, but is there one finals appearance that sticks out more than any other for you? Oh, look, the first – there's actually two stick out. The first one uh, when we beat Newtown, the first time Parramatta won a competition, that was yeah. that was certainly the, the, the special one, but – 
the one that stands out for me the most is when we beat Manly the year, a year later. And, and uh, with Manly, Manly beat us in every game during the year. And they beat us, they smashed us in the semi final. Yeah. Um, so and they had, a, 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 I suppose, their team was full of Australian players. They were always going to be the team to that were never going to lose that. But um, yeah, that was winning that game was just uh, one of those games where everything went right for us. Our fours were just dominant. Um, and every time we touched the ball, uh, things turned the goal for us. And we, in the last five minutes of the first half, I think we scored three tries. And um, yeah, we put Manly to bed in, in that in that time, and and just defended our asses off in the second half. So yeah, just beating Manly in that game probably was the the game that I, I think about the most. So, but the first one against Newtown was because it was Parramatta's first. That was it's also yeah. just a special. Yeah, mate, absolutely. And of course, getting it over your arch enemy, Manly is. Is also a good feeling. <laughs> I mean, anytime you beat Manly is a good day. <laughs> that's it, mate. That's it. I love it, uh, mate. Did you have a favourite coach? Ah, uh, look, there was probably two two coaches. When I was when I was a kid growing up, I had a had a fellow called Mark O'Reilly, and Mark, yeah, uh, he was actually Bob O'Reilly's brother. Oh wow! But what but what Mark did for Eric and myself was uh, he didn't he he didn't allow us to get big heads. He he was just as tough on us as as anybody else, even tougher. Um, and yeah, he 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 put discipline in, into how we played, and, and Jack refined that when we when we went into grade. But Mark was the one who actually uh, kept us level headed as kids. Um, and then going into into uh, grade and having Jack, um, who actually yeah taught us how to how to I suppose prepare prepare ourselves for those big games and. Yeah. Um, and prepare, prepare ourselves to, to play the games we needed to play. It was, yeah, that was, I suppose, next level. So that, they're probably the main two coaches who, who um, sort of moulded me over the years. Yeah, nice, mate. Now, my next question, did you have a funniest teammate that you played with? Oh, it was, it was two, really. Um, Paul, Paul Taylor was always a practical joker. Yeah. Um, Taz was always doing something. And, yeah, it was, it was always... Um, yeah, just fun to be around. But the other one was Brett Kenny. Um, yeah. People know how how good a player Brett was, but but Brett Brett was a he was a funny funniest fellow to be around when when we're getting ready for games or after games. And yeah, it's just yeah, we just always have a good laugh, have a good time, and yeah, it was just one of those. Uh, both those players just just great to be around because you're laughing all the time, and and um, I don't, never never get too serious. But Brett, only, Brett only got serious after the ref, after the um kickoff whistle went. Once the kickoff went, that's, that's when Brett got serious. Before before that, it, it was um yeah, it was it was um always bell of laugh. So yeah, Brett and Tazza, great to be yeah. around. I love it, mate. Now off the back of that, strangest teammate. Who's someone you played alongside that you just they were a bit quirky? <laughs> oh, Eric, hundred <laughs> percent. I grew up with Eric, and he's, he's a strange oh. critter. <laughs> I tell him all the time, don't worry. <laughs> That's but great. um, yeah. Well, like when he, when he got his nickname Guru and he's sitting in the middle of the field meditating, and um, I mean it's it worked for Eric, but um, yeah, we uh, we certainly have some fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he all these little quirky things he come up with and try you try and do and. Yeah, we'd have some fun with him, that's for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I love hearing that. Now, mate, when you finished up, you obviously went over to Super League as well, but how was retirement from the game for you? Um, when I retired, I was actually ready, I was ready to retire. I, um, I, I'd had uh, three shoulder, maybe four shoulder surgeries, one each year for the last four years. And yeah. the, I went over in England and played um, uh, for, uh, for Wakefield and, the last in end of eighty eight and beginning of eighty nine, and um, the last four games I played over there, but I dislocated my shoulder two or three times in every in those games. Um, in the last game against Warrington at Warrington, I had to come out four times, and um, I had to I had to push it back in four times, and and it was I'd already had th- uh, three four reconstructions since then, before then, so the, the reconstructions weren't working. And I'll just yeah, just my shoulder kept giving away. So yeah, I walked off and um put my boots in the garbage bin said uh, said to my wife at the time, I've um I've had enough and um threw my bin, threw my boots in the bin and that was it. Yeah, nice mate. And after so, did you stay involved in the game? Um I sort of to answer that, probably no. 
mm. I I sort of got away from the game and yeah. um we moved down south. Um I stayed on, on where we where we lived for a little while, but then I moved down south and then beside the coach. I moved, I moved down south to a place called Eden. Um and um yeah, so I went down there and just get a, get away from Sydney and a nice country area and so I went down there and coached for two years and I had the best time just, just coaching the, the local uh, footy team down there, the Eden Tigers. and uh, made some wonderful friends down there and just a really lovely lifestyle. And and then, um, yeah, I decided to move back up the Central Coast um, oh, nice. back in 90, end of 91. So, um, yeah, I moved back up, moved up the Central Coast and ended up getting a job in the hospital, which I've been ever since. So, um, yeah, so I've been... Been on the coast, uh, on the central coast now since nineteen since in yeah, nineteen ninety one. So I'm um, fair while now, but yeah. So I'm, and I've been working at the hospital uh, all that time. So it's just yeah, getting getting away from football was good. Then going back and doing a bit of coaching was nice. But um, I suppose the most enjoyable time I've had footy wise after I retired was actually helping out as a dad's helper with uh, my kids playing footy. Um, not a, not a, not actually being a coach of the kids' side, but just going down helping the coaches, yeah. and um, support and watching the kids play and watch them grow and learn and get better. And yes, that's probably the the thing which I enjoy. Even now, my uh, my twenty year old, my twenty two year old, um, watching them play and, just, and um, helping them out with, if they want help. And if they don't want help, that's fine too. But yeah, just happy to see them play footy and and uh, enjoy it. Yeah, for sure. And I think grassroots is just so important. I think we need more more in that area at the moment. But let's talk about current NRL. Now, what is one rule that you would like to change in the NRL today? Oh, one rule. Well, there's, probably, there's probably a lot. <laughs> there is a lot. <laughs> oh, God. I suppose the thing which frustrates me the most is are scrums. Yeah. Um, probably the um, – yeah, the way it's, the way it's scrums are, are these days are just – yeah, it's more of an embarrassment to watch them. So I don't know. I don't know how they get rid of what they do to get rid of them, or I don't know. Yeah. But I don't understand how in, in rugby union they can have scrums, but we can't. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't understand that. And I suppose the thing which I also look at is, I mean, the, the players are tough these days, and they're tough when we're playing as well. But it's a tough game, and the players are tough these days. But the and I, and I totally understand the. Um, the reasons for not not having letting people fight and that sort of stuff, and that's mm-hmm. not actually agree today. I think having um having the, the 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 opportunity to stop people getting hit in the head and punched and whatever, I think it's, it's really good because it saves a lot, a lot of people getting hurt. Yeah. But what frustrates me is when halfbacks come in and start pushing a, full, a front row around. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's like, that that would never happen to Terry Lee, but that would never happen no. to Les Davidson. That would never happen to Les Boyd. So. But um yeah, and and my also understand times have changed. But um yeah, it's just amazing how, how times have changed where small yeah. fellas now can go in and start pushing around and there's no consequences where back in the early days Sterling pushed um one bulldog player around and, and um cement Dave Gillespie gave him a towel and so um <laughs> yeah, you, you just gotta yeah. Uh, I suppose that's probably one of the areas I I, I laugh at these days when in half yeah. packs and and small fellas go in and start pushing big fellas around. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Now, mate, what is one piece of advice that you could give a young player coming through? Oh, look, I, I got asked this question the other day. I was, I was at a um a fundraiser um for a friend of ours at cancer, and I got asked the same question. And um, probably the one thing which I always think about is if you're a young kid going through, the first thing you need to do is make your parents proud. No, and cool. um and one of the, if if you're you're doing things you're, you're doing things right and you're you're progressing and uh, your parents are proud of you that's I mean that's that's to me that's everything look yeah. at, make sure they're they're happy with what you're doing how you're going and make them proud and the rest will fall in the place but um yeah always always think your family yeah I love that mate that's a, that's an awesome answer just before we finish up we've got a couple more things here mate what aspect of the game could the NRL improve in. Uh, that's a that's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's there's been so many rule changes um, over the over the last couple of years. I'm just really hard to keep up with. Like, um, I'm struggling to understand what rules are these days and what what yeah. what's it for. And like, I'm just really hard to keep it up. But look, I I don't know what they can do to to make. I mean, I like how the old games used to play, but 
yeah, I'm, um, sure. I'm, I would have, but yeah, I'm not real sure what they could do to, to fix the game up these days. That's a hard question. <laughs> Yeah, my, my biggest one would be more funding into grassroots. I think we need more funding in our junior uh, footy. Yeah. Start bringing them well, up. Well, look, I, I'd, actually, I'd agree to that. I think junior development um, in, in country areas is is something that we yeah. need to look at. It's, yeah. um, I know rugby league struggled in, in uh, Group 16 when I was down there. and um, yep. There was a lot of a lot of money and a lot of junior development put into – um, Sydney area and, and the mm. sub and the and the little country towns just outside of Sydney, but the uh, areas down right down to far south coast uh, had had no input from um, ARL, NRL, or anybody in regards to junior development. And out west, um, yeah, I think I think more more funding into junior development and yeah, but not only junior development but also into developing referees. Oh, so yeah, I think we need sure. to support the opportunity to develop more referees as well. Yeah, mate, I completely agree there. Now, before we finish up, can you give us a prediction? Who's going to win the comp? I know we're, we've got about seven rounds to go, but is there a clear favourite for you at the moment? Oh, look at this. No no clear favourite, but I, 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 the two best teams at the moment are still um, Penrith and, uh, and Storm. So uh, yeah. they're the best two at the moment. I mean, the dark horse is still the Broncos because they've still got the mm. players that can win a comp, but I think they're, they're probably the, the two top teams at the moment. And wouldn't be surprised if Penrith... Get a um, get another one up because they just got some. Yeah. It's got some of the best players in their side. So, but um, look, Storm are going great as well. So, yeah, it's a toss the coin between those two. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a Chooks man myself, but uh, it wasn't I can't great, go there. <laughs> it wasn't. It, it wasn't a great game on uh, the the other night, but that's all right. But anyway, yeah. we want to thank you for your time, Steve. It was uh, it was an awesome interview. Um, obviously. This episode has dropped as people are listening. So you can find that on all available uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on all social media, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And we'll tag the link in the description, of course. But thank you, mate. I'm Joey. That's Steve. Be good.